We are going to discuss as much as we can the future of science and the full title is the future of science in Eastern Europe or Central Europe. Now, be careful, there is uh, at the highest level, uh, there is no such thing as Protestant science, Catholic science, uh, liberal science, conservative science, or Central European science. If somebody discovers something in science in Macedonia or the Philippines of New and New Zealand, and if it's correct, then it's correct everywhere. If it's wrong somewhere, it's found to be among the learned people to be wrong, then it's wrong everywhere, right? So that's very important to note. What, however, is an important issue, uh, how are we going to um, execute, uh, practice science in Central Europe in the coming few decades? Because the region obviously has certain problems. Uh, money is, of course, one of them, but there are also others how you make priorities and so on. So we are going to touch upon these issues as well. But first and foremost, we would like to concentrate on science as such. Right? And there are some general questions. Uh, our panelists uh, have received the questions, and there will be others, and there will be room for discussion with the audience as well. Um, uh, we are going to make uh, uh, you know, self-introductions in the sense that everybody is going to tell uh, who she or he is and uh, a few words about uh, the respective achievements. As you can see, I wanted to establish a heterogeneous group with various uh, types of expertise, background, age, and so on and so forth, which I think is very important. However, there is one common denominator. I went for demonstrated excellence. So I can testify that everybody, one way or the other, is an excellent scientist on the panel. Um, now, uh, with, without further ado, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Urs Satmari. I'm an evolutionary biologist, mostly known for the comparative and theoretical analysis of how higher levels of biological organization arose from lower levels. So, for, for example, how do you put together an animal society from originally solitary individuals and so on, and that has repeated itself uh, several times again and again. Um, I, uh, well, a friend of mine told whenever he looks at my presentations on the first slide, every time there is one more affiliation. <laughs> now, I can assure you that uh, this is going to back to, you know, to uh, uh, in these days. So now, uh, uh, last year I spent uh, together with some of my colleagues at uh, IASC partly, partly still in Munich, um, and the Parmenides Foundation. Now I am building up a new evolutionary initiative in the Ecological Research Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Um, and, uh, okay, so let's proceed in this direction. Okay. Uh, I'm Dan Brooks. Um, I'm currently from Gürd, Hungary, which is where my wife lives. Um, uh, I was, for many years, I was a professor at the University of Toronto in, in Canada um, and retired early in 2010 because I discovered that universities were no longer capable of, of providing the freedom that I needed to do some of the things I wanted to do which specifically had to do with, with issues of climate change and biodiversity. And because of my, my training as a parasitologist, that quickly became climate change and emerging disease, which is, is what I'm specializing in now. Uh, two colleagues of mine and I have just finished a book that's now in production with the University of Chicago Press. It'll be out next year called A Perfect Storm um, <clears throat> that's about climate change and disease. Um, and, and I think my primary purpose in being here is to be the old curmudgeon. <laughs> so I'm Janos Ashbut. I'm a physicist from Budapest. I work at the, the Institute for Solid State Physics of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in the Department of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information. So uh, I don't deal with uh, crisis on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Um, I, I spent uh, some years abroad in, in uh, Western Europe before coming back to, to Budapest, and I'm, um, I'm working on 
uh, using quantum physics, quantum mechanics, to build a, a, a better quantum computer. I'm a theorist, so I'm, I'm working on projects which are on the side, but loosely connected to this general topic of quantum computing. My name is Agnes Kospal. I'm an astrophysicist. I work at the Research Center for Astronomy and Earth Sciences of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, also in Budapest. I also returned to Hungary uh, after spending several years abroad. Uh, I'm uh, currently funded uh, by a large research grant from uh, the European Research Council. I'm leading a research group uh, in Budapest, and what we are studying is how stars like our sun and how planets like our Earth uh, are uh, being born, so I'm studying young stars, but by understanding how stars are currently being born, I hope that uh, eventually we will understand how our, our sun and our own planet Earth were born. Oh, you have already introduced yourself, so hi, I'm Harold de Vladar, uh, Venezuelan origin, somehow half Hungarian. Um, I also was a fellow here in the Institute. At the moment, I am in Parmenides Foundation in Munich and also at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And um, I also I am establishing my own company on synthetic biology because me and my company, we want to enable the growth of synthetic biology in the next decade. And, um, well, essentially, I am a theoretical biologist uh, be who became an experimental biologist. My background is uh, dual, it's uh, from physics and biology, it's actually both, and lately I also became interested in arts and became an artist in the University of Applied of Vienna. But uh, having a startup uh, company, it's a daily crisis management, so my art interests have been postponed for a few um, years, I presume. Hi, uh, I'm Bolas Pop, I'm uh, from Seged, in from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, the Biological Research Center of this. And uh, I also spent a couple of years uh, in Western Europe, specifically in the UK, in Manchester, in Cambridge, and in Bath, before I returned and established my, my research lab. And, and my background is in, in genetics and evolutionary biology and systems biology, which more or less means that what we try to understand is how the cellular, how knowing the cellular details would help us to understand how evolution occurs and also to understand how the cellular details themselves evolve among different organisms. My name is Peter Schuster. I am presumably the oldest person here on the panel. I retired 2009 and it was not early retirement. <laughs> I am a chemist uh, by training and uh, then went into computer applications in chemistry, became a theorist, and as a theorist, I got intrigued by biology and by evolution, and did some models in evolution, and also became interested in the role of RNA. I have a belief, it's not a secret belief of mine, but I think, and you will also hear uh, when we discuss, the, the future of science. I believe in the unity of science and in particular now in the merger of chemistry and biology. As I probably mentioned, I prepared a, a list of questions. Uh, the list starts with number one, but I have a zeroes question which I did not ventilate, but I think it would be nice to find out because uh, that's always an interesting question. The question is, the zeroes question is, why did you go into science? Huh? That's the question. So just very briefly state your primary motivation, the main influence, and let's start from yeah. that direction. Yeah. Actually, I wanted uh, uh, to study mathematics, but uh, my family said, as mathematician, wonderful, you become a teacher at school. And there was one thing I hated in this age, and I still hate it, to be a teacher at school. So I, I decided that you have to do, I have to do something else. And then chemistry was of interest of mine. But I never, I never lost my love for mathematics. And during my studies of chemistry, I took mathematics courses. So I came via mathematics into science. I always had a curiosity about how things work, and so I 
very early on got interested in physics and biology and actually even started both degrees at the university but then realized that, that there are just so much more many open questions and exciting questions for me in, in biology, especially in evolutionary biology, so I more or less switched to, the, to it and, uh, and stick to that since then. Yeah, in my case, it's I cannot trace it back to one reason. I think I the earliest I can trace back is just like stealing my grandfather's books and trying to understand what the hell is molecular biology and what these chemical formulas meant. And I, I'll never liked chemistry with all respect. To <laughs> <laughs> all the things change in time, obviously. And, <laughs> And then I was also puzzled by Jacques Cousteau's uh, videos of uh, underwater uh, explorations and all these things sort of came together. And eventually I went into biology and I was forced to take physics courses and then I was just like, general, uh, special relativity rocks, I, I want to learn more of these and more of these and then I got into physics and then, but I liked biology too much so I could not decide so I had to finish both and so we go. Um, as to myself, um, I think I had two crucial influences when I was at the elementary school. One was the novels by Jules Verne. I remember I was uh, reading that novels at school under the table. <laughs> as you can, <laughs> your experience with teachers, right? So, uh, as you can imagine, that has generated certain ill feelings among the uh, members of the uh, pedagogic circle, uh, to the extent that I was called in by the director and uh, he assured me that if that happens again and again, they are going to kick me out because I don't belong into school. Uh, second uh, very important influence was uh, a biology teacher uh, uh, who taught us from uh, the year uh, 5th to the 8th at the elementary school and uh, besides the usual stuff, she was conducting a special uh, lesson for those people who were interested. And we were, we were doing real experiments, biochemical experiments, looking into the microscope when we were at the age of 10, 11, 12, and so on. So that was quite remarkable. And then this continued uh, in, a, in, a, in a way at the, at the secondary school where I regularly went to something which was called the Free University in Budapest, uh, where the best professors were teaching, by the way. And so the lectures there were often quite much better than the lectures at, at the university, yeah? because it was a highly selected uh, um, uh, group of, of uh, teachers and professors. And then I was hesitating between uh, evolution, origin of life, and cosmology and then somehow the balance was tilted in favor of biology and evolution. So that's the origin story for me. For me, it, it also started in my childhood, one of my fondest memories uh, when we uh, were sitting in the grass in our backyard with my parents in, in summer evenings and we were watching the stars and I was full of questions, full of curiosity and, and asked questions to my parents about the constellations and what stars are and which points of light are the stars and which are the planets and how, how do we know what we know about them. And of course, my parents answered until their uh, knowledge uh, uh, lasted and then they urged me to, to uh, take uh, books in my hands and, and, and look for answers in, in them and then they encouraged me to, to learn things for myself and uh, that's what I did ever since. So I started uh, with, with mathematics and then physics and then of course I, I finished physics and astronomy together at the uni university and, and uh, I'm, I'm also very grateful for my, uh, to my teachers and, and mentors who uh, truly or not truly, I don't know, but they made me believe that I can, I can achieve whatever I want if I put any uh, Put enough uh, energy and, and time behind behind it. So that's that's why I like research. So my answer uh, would be the same as Balaj gave. I was interested in how stuff works, and uh, one of and the early memories, as 
an inspiring moment was a trip with my family somewhere where my uncle explained to me on the train uh, how water boils. And uh, I remember that was such a nice experience to understand, oh, how it boils. So that set the path for me to, to be interested in physics. That's very cool. I don't have anything to <coughs> yeah. I was just one of those kids who liked to wander around in the forest after school, mm -hmm. looking, turning over logs and looking under rocks and things like that. My parents thought that that would automatically lead me into medical school. <coughs> but fortunately, when I was a, beginning as a first year university student, there, there was a, a professor who decided that every time I tried to sign up for a pre-med course, he would say, you don't want to take human genetics, take general genetics. You don't want to take human anatomy, take comparative anatomy. And, um, and then my last year as an undergraduate, just before graduate school, uh, I was, was invited to go on a field trip to Colombia. And that was it. That just six weeks in the middle of the jungles in South America. And when I went, I thought, you know, I had a bachelor's degree in biology. I really know a lot of biology. And after six weeks, I realized I didn't know anything. <laughs> And it was like, you mean I can keep doing this and every time I come here I'm going to learn all kinds of new things? And that was it. And now we uh, go into the uh, real stuff. Um, and my first question was, from your perspective, what will the next 30 years of science bring? Now, of course, that you can argue that's a highly contingent question. Uh, for example, the tacit, one of the tacit assumptions behind my question was that there will be a kind of uh, learned society and civilization <laughs> in the next 30 years uh, for which there is no guarantee. But suppose that you know, we are not going to collapse or at least not that fast. What do you expect that science is, uh, is, is going to bring us? I would like to say, as, uh, as, as uh, Er said already, continuity of our society is a, is a prerequisite. Without that, we cannot discuss the question at all. Now, uh, I think there will be what I call minor changes, and you will see these changes are not minor, but they are already, we are in a period of transition. And these transitions have started already and are going to continue. So there are no big surprises in that. And then we have uh, things, some we might guess, others we can't guess at all, uh, which bring completely new things in. And among these, these minor changes, I think it is worth recalling what happened in the last 30 years. And uh, since uh, we are more or less inclined uh, in the direction of biology. Why not look 30 years ago about DNA sequencing techniques? And it's interesting, the, uh, the techniques were there. They were available. So in that case, it's just a minor change what occurred in, the site, uh, in, this, in these 30 years. However, uh, these techniques were highly inefficient. When you think about the human, human genome sequencing project, for example, it lasted 13 years and required about uh, $3 billion. In 2011, sequencing a human genome, so the same problem, uh, lasted about two weeks and costed as little as $5,000. And today a human genome can be sequenced in less than 24 hours and they are fighting about $10 going down to $1. So you see, in principle, almost nothing has happened, but the situation is completely different uh, nowadays. And so I listed a few of these so-called minor changes in the future, which I think uh, uh, might be important. Electronic storage and retrieval of knowledge. I believe in 30 years, the scientists will do everything on things that are already there, tablets, uh, 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 computers, and so on. And the printed books 
will be gone. They will not be gone completely, is my prediction. Uh, they will be objects of decoration at some collector's preference. But in science, my belief is printed, uh, 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 printed books and, 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 and journals will be gone. Everything will be electronic. Automat automation will completely take over. Now, we, we see already doing experiments nowadays, there is a lot of automation. Uh, data will be exclusively harvested, processed, managed, and stored by computers. And thereby, there is a hope which is uh, parallel to what Sidney Brenner says. We are storing all kinds of things nowadays but in 30 years, hopefully only the things that are really worth being stored will be stored, and this will reduce uh, the data flood uh, accordingly. Automation is not restricted to science. Uh, this, well, uh, this development will dominate, as it starts already, whole life and uh, society. Then, uh, it's already there, complexity research, but it's still in some areas, at least uh, in my view, it's a, it's a little bit cloudy, nebulous, and one doesn't know really how to treat complex systems. Now, I, I, I believe that this will change in 30 years, and one will learn really to distinguish between different complex systems and to treat them in a different way. There was about 20 years ago the idea uh, to have common themes in the theory of complexity. Now this is, uh, this is abolished, nobody thinks that anymore. Complex systems are individuals, but nevertheless there will be recipes. And what will be the outcome? The outcome is predictions and control mechanisms will improve substantially. And actually, I have witnessed such an improvement in predictions, and that's the weather forecast. When I think when I was a, a little boy, uh, my grandmother always said, did they guess the weather correctly? And, 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 and that was it. So, so sometimes they were right, sometimes they were wrong. <laughs> one didn't know. Now, what has changed? In, in, in the weather forecast. Why is it better now? And there are, there are three things. One is much more data. Uh, real wealth of data is available nowadays that did not exist. Computers, models, weather forecast models can be calculated nowadays was completely impossible uh, in, the, in the 50s, uh, 60s of last century. And so I think this will be one of the major things not restricted to the weather, but also to predictions, developments of society. Then coming to, to biology, I believe that uh, systems biology will successfully, and they said this already, integrate chemistry and biology. And uh, what we need in evolution, I don't know whether Ursh would agree, a, a new quantitative theory of inheritance which emerges from the current wells of partially confusing data and will replace present-day genetics. And then there are many other things that we can mention. And then let me end with saying more ambitious goals. One is already discussed, but by far not uh, uh, achieved. And this is individualized medicine specific pharmacology. So to tailor drugs for the patient. And this faces two things. First of all, it faces a scientific problem. And the second problem is a problem of society. Who is going to pay uh, for such an individualized medicine? How can we arrange that this becomes cheap? And then my final credo is, I believe in a great merger of disciplines in science. Physics and chemistry have already merged. Biology will follow. And uh, a most powerful merger 
presumably will be in the next 30 years the unification of neurobiology, brain research and psychology. And I have to excuse myself in one aspect. When I say a merger appears, that means we have a common theory and we have a common uh, field. However, a chemist will still remain a chemist because he has to learn how uh, to do his experiments. Biology will still remain a biologist, but they will be integrated into science. I would like, oh, okay, to refer, because I would like to reflect on some of the mm -hmm. excellent suggestions that, uh, that uh, uh, Peter made. So, so one of them is, is about having some fields more being, becoming more predictive. And, uh, and one of the fields I'm, I'm quite interested in is evolutionary biology. And getting, knowing more about evolution is not just about you know, looking deeper into the past or, or resolving some mysteries that happened in the past, but also some very practical aspects like being able to forecast evolution, maybe on a very short term, maybe just a few weeks or few months, but that could save lives. So if you think about that evolution actually happening in front of our, our eyes when we are talking about microbes like bacteria, viruses and so on, or even cancer. These are all phenomena treating a bacteria with an antibiotics would induce basically an evolutionary response and then the bacteria often gets resistance. If we would understand better how the resistance occurs how different treatments would affect these resistance, then we might have a better tools to treat these diseases. And this is, at the moment, almost completely ignored in the healthcare industry. I mean, the problem is recognized, but the, the, on a daily basis, when you go to the doctor and he or she would prescribe an antibiotic, this kind of evolutionary thinking or, or all the data that comes from from the evolutionary aspect of antibiotic resistance, it's just not present in the, in the everyday practice. So, and it's partly the reason is that we, we still don't understand fully what would be the best treatments and how to convince the doctors. But, uh, but this is a field that would, I think, grow uh, rapidly and, and predicting short-term evolution, uh, the required data would be acquired. It's partly just uh, genetic data that we need to collect more uh, uh, systematically, and of course new theories are needed and new type of experiments to test uh, these theories. Uh, the other aspect I would like to reflect on is the, is the, is the genome sequencing business, which is really being, you know, uh, uh, going very fast these days. And it really, I, I, I agree that it has reached the point where now it's almost certain that in few decades we have, we all have our own genome data, and, uh, and not just at the individual level, but maybe if we have a tumor cell, it would also be sequenced. If we have a parasite that attacking us, it would also be sequenced. So you have a massive amounts of genetic data uh, at the level of individuals, and so actually population genetics theory, which is about you know figuring out how the genetic composition of the population changes through time can be feeded in with such sort of data and so we would have new sorts of predictions that was just completely impossible uh, a few years ago. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, just DNA, if I have to kind of highlight one huge discovery that would certainly uh, change everything is, is, is DNA sequencing and the amount of data generated for, for all of us. The question was, from my perspective, what will the next decades of science uh, bring? So I have to apologize, but my perspective is really narrow compared to who are speaking before me, because I'm an astronomer, so I'm, I'm focusing on astronomy. Uh, and uh, But that's, that's still a broad area, and I, I think there's going to be really interesting things I, I would not say that we will have discovered this or that, or we will have understood this or that, because because past experience shows that whenever people make predictions like that, they're almost uh, always wrong. But uh, what I can predict is that we, we will be looking for bias uh, signatures, for example, so we will be looking for uh, 
uh, life in, in other planets, especially uh, exoplanets, so planets that are orbiting faraway stars. And this is a very interesting, very complex question because the researchers are still debating what is a biosignature, what, 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 what the thing is that we can believe signals that there is life somewhere far away. And this is a complex question that will require the cooperation, collaboration between biologists and astronomers and earth scientists and planetologists and, and, and even climate scientists. So this is going to be, this is being, and it's going to be a very, very stimulating research direction. Also, uh, uh, I, I would like to see progress in, in my specific field, which is how stars and planets are being born. And this is a very interesting question, and this is a very up-to-date question nowadays because there is so much progress in the observational techniques that nowadays we can resolve uh, uh, exoplanets that are orbiting uh, faraway stars. So, uh, until recently, when we made an image of such a system, everything, the, the whole planetary system and the star, everything was within one single pixel. Now this is not true anymore. We can we can actually image these these things separately, and this is this is really amazing. And and then hopefully in, in the next decades we will be able to see how these things are being born real time by by making snapshot images or or even movies of how the the gaseous material that builds up the star actually moves. Uh, so that's that's going to be really interesting. Uh, Moving a bit to the space science aspect, uh, uh, this is a bit different because uh, uh, building uh, uh, planetary missions, for example, takes decades. So uh, you can remember, some of, some of you probably uh, have seen in the past few years, very, very spectacular images like the, uh, those of Pluto from the New Horizons mission or or, or, or the images that uh, the Rosetta mission uh, brought from, from, a, uh, from the nucleus of a comet. So we actually managed to land on a comet. Uh, and, and then those very nice Martian landscapes from the, uh, from the Mars rovers. Uh, but there's a lot of work uh, uh, and development behind these. And uh, so the coming decades, we, uh, there are plans to, to study uh, Mercury and also the, the moons of Jupiter. But hopefully we will we will keep planning these kind of missions, and maybe we will not have uh, sent uh, an actual person, an astronaut, to to another planet. But I really hope that there will be at least plans for <laughs> for that. Uh, I so so these these are these were the, basically the, the the very expensive uh, um, mission building things or telescope building things, things that you need tel new telescopes and new uh, space instruments for. But I think there is also very uh, great uh, discovery potential in virtual uh, observatory. It's basically a database that contains all the astronomical images ever taken uh, because we have, we have more and more of these. And, uh, uh, and if, if you have devised, uh, if you devise clever ways to how to connect information in, in these, there's there's a lot of hidden knowledge uh, in these archives. And and for this, we will need very special statistical techniques or visual visual visualization techniques to to deal with. with Big data, so large databases, and also wider data. So different kinds of like images taken at different wavelengths or with different methods, and how to synthesize these things. And uh, speaking about astronomy, of course, astronomy is a very good example of, of a science which is uh, very, very. We have very uh, general uh, instruments. So if you build a telescope. That's that's not a single-purpose telescope. You can you can look at anything on the sky with a telescope. So in, in the future, if, if if a researcher has a crazy idea, that, well, let's look at that object and and study this aspect, that then might lead to a very nice discovery that we haven't ever anticipated before. And this happened in the past in astronomy, like the, the discovery of, of, of the moons of Jupiter by, by Galileo, or, or the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, complete accident, <laughs> or, or the discovery of gamma ray bursts, again, a complete accident. So I'm, what I'm really most excited about is these, these unexpected discoveries, and astronomy has a great potential in, in this. Um, 
So Agi mentioned uh, finding clever ways to cope with big data, and uh, Peter mentioned uh, bringing the costs of individualized medicine down. And uh, I think artificial intelligence will be one of a key uh, technology to enable both of these goals and much more. This will certainly have a transformative uh, uh, influence on science, pretty much all branches of science. I'm starting to see it in my field, so it's, it's not a lot, but every week I see a paper where some, some, artificial, some artificial intelligence algorithm is used to find connections which would be very hard for a human to spot. So that's, uh, that's a key thing. Another key thing is uh, fusion, which um, has, it has not been achieved so far in the sense that it would bring a positive energy balance, but this is one of the big goals of uh, physics now, and, and um, we heard this morning about the various different uh, sources of crisis that we face today, and the energy crisis is, is one of these crises, so we have to find some source of energy that uh, will take over once we run out of, uh, of uh, coal and oil. And uh, fusion could be one of the sources of, of energy. And uh, narrowing the focus down on, on my own field of, of research is uh, the dream of the quantum computer, which was uh, dreamt up in the 80s by uh, theoretical physicists. And this has been uh, something that uh, has driven both uh, theoretical and experimental research in physics. And we are on the verge of a breakthrough now. We have experimental quantum computers comprising a uh, few bits. So the current record is uh, 16 bits. And uh, the current goal is to go up to 50 bits within two years. But uh, this will be very far from something that's actually practical to use. But within the next 30 years, I think there is strong hope that we will actually manage to build a quantum computer. And uh, I'm not sure that having a quantum computer will transform our society, but it will open up uh, some new areas of research. One of the, of the goals which people mention is uh, fertilizer. So to, to, to make artificial fertilizer, which is, uh, which is energy effective enough, it, it's, it would drive the energy cost of uh, providing food down. And uh, some of the problems there is, is to find chemical reactions which are, uh, which are more efficient than the ones which we use nowadays, and a quantum computer could be a tool which uh, would be useful there. This is a very tough question. First of all, as a scientist, I should trust predictions, but I think like, this is one of the situations where you're we're going to be most likely wrong, of course. If things are not changing, uh, at least in the, in the big in the bulk of, of how things are done, all of our dreams would become true in, in, in the sense of technological achievements. Um, what I doubt is that these conditions will remain. Um, I don't want to be too apocalyptic. I'll leave that to them. Um, what I believe is that the whole system of science in terms of funding, in terms of universities, what is an institute, etc., this needs to change because of the amount of scientists, because of the limited funding, etc. And it's, I believe, this doesn't mean it's what I want, by the way, but I believe that it's going to be much more goal-oriented, the development of science. So it will be more focused on technological development and te technological achievement. I personally think, of course, I am highly biased, that this is going to come mostly from biology. I think AI is having its five minutes at the moment. I mean, it's awesome. I'm not against AI. I mean, but AI for us is like robots in, 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 in the 50s or something like that. It's going to solve everything. It's going to give us uh, plenty of free time. We don't have to worry because AI will solve it. AI is going to do something. It's going to do a lot. But when you think it, AI is so, uh, not... Uh, um, going against you, it's just that... Uh, they beat us in poker already. <laughs> um, AI, if you, if you see it in, in the technological um, uh, area, is mostly um, implemented for technologies that are benefiting very specific uh, places in the world, uh, namely Silicon Valley, New York, uh, so, to some extent Europe, but not even. So this is more like for certain types of places, but it's not going to solve 
major problems, and therefore you won't uh, you won't have that much uh, uh, of a future in that sense. However, there's another perspective to this that with the potential deterioration, not to mention collapse of academic systems, uh, private companies are going to take over this role, right? Uh, like Google is doing, okay? Google is not only about sending spam and, and, and ads, uh, but they do also invest very actively in actual basic science. It's not what you hear every day, but they do. They have their clear goal to achieve uh, real AI by 2030, 2020. I don't know what the time is, but many companies which, which are private have like um, very uh, honest uh, scientific goals. And I personally think this is what is going to be taking over in the next uh, years. Uh, therefore, I myself am implementing that as a safety net in part, uh, because I want to make sure I can do the science I want to do in, 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 in 10 years, and I don't want to be constrained by not writing the grant that is uh, not fashionable for the reviewers, for instance. So I cannot tell how it's going to be in 30 years, but uh, this is more or less my perspective. Well, I'm, I'm a member of what's called the Cassandra Collective. Uh, it's a group of senior biologists and climate scientists and people who've been at this, on this long march for 30 or 40 years. And, and I think 30 years from now, uh, science will have answered this fundamental question. We, we will know 30 years from now whether or not technological humanity will make it to the 22nd century. That's, that will be the main, that will be the main issue for the next 30 years. Every now and then, uh, major journals like Nature and Science are putting uh, out, uh, or even on the front cover, a list of outstanding scientific questions. And then there's a prime group and there is, a, you know, the, uh, the others are, well, very important, but not outstandingly important. So usually what they do, they single out 10 really outstanding important questions, and then they complete it uh, with a list that goes up to 100, roughly, something like that. Uh, now, obviously, such a list can be drawn at the moment as well, but I would like to mention two that are coming back again and again. Uh, one problem that uh, we would like to understand sooner or later is the origin of life. The origin of life is a notoriously difficult problem, uh, but there have been significant advances in the past decades uh, in two ways. Um, first, there have been uh, new theoretical concepts and uh, uh, highly, um, highly developed uh, experimental methods applied to the problem. The other thing is that we can now produce sharper and sharper hypotheses, right? So it's, it's, it's actually an increase in knowledge when you can say, this and that is the kind of thing that I don't know, or you know, compare it with saying, well, I don't have a clue, right? So the first is obviously, when you get to the, fir the, the first version, obviously that's an advance. So I expect that there, uh, there will be um, a significant advance in the next 30 years, uh, but be careful what, that, what it means. It doesn't mean that we will know uh, that how life actually originated on the Earth. The target is to come up with a scenario or with a number of scenarios about which the experts can agree, this is how it might have happened. You know, when we are there and everybody agrees, okay, that's fine, in a way the work is complete. But as I say, I do expect significant advance in that uh, field in the next uh, 30 years. Uh, the other uh, uh, equally important or even more important uh, is, uh, which was already mentioned, that's how complex thinking is being carried out. How people generate insights, right? As opposed to incremental problem solving. How they are able to as Ferenc would say, get out of the box. I mean, what are the underlying um, uh, neurobiological, psychological mechanisms that helps you to do such a recognition? Uh, how do you develop language in children? And how could have language 
as a faculty originated from Homo erectus unto Homo sapiens. Uh, there was a book a few years ago, I remember, about the origin of language, and the first chapter had the title, The Origin of Language, the Hardest Problem in Science. Now, uh, you can argue about this, it was definitely one of the hardest problems of science at the moment, but with the advance in computer uh, experiments, a better understanding of linguistics, a deeper understanding of how the brain works, uh, uh, put, if you can put this together also with the data of the genetics of the sort that Peter was mentioning, then you can uh, hope that there will be, even if not a complete understanding, but a much more um, convincing list of specific questions that you have to address in the future to make further advance in the field. Um, so these, these are two really very important outstanding questions, and I think it's very important. Um, what I would also like to say, although it cuts a little bit in one of the next questions about technology, that I think AI is a little bit more important than, than, than you portray. Um, and that's also worrying, so I take a few minutes for that because I think it's important. Uh, there was a big, uh, how should I say, uh, media uh, excitement when uh, uh, DeepMind, which is a company that was bought up by Google, announced that, uh, uh, that the uh, artificial intelligence program that they developed was able to beat the Go champion uh, uh, of Europe. And uh, now, of course, immediately there was a reaction, especially from Asia, ha, 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 ha that, that's nothing. <laughs> Don't try to beat a European GO, try to beat an Asian GO champion. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the Asian GO champion was beaten half a year later. Now, okay, uh, you could say that this is just by brute force. Uh, it's also that, but it's not only that, and that sh the following uh, uh, phenomenon shows that. So the play, the Go play, was then of course analyzed after the event. And the former champion, or the, the, the living human champion, uh, was reanalyzing the, the steps. And uh, on two occasions, at least, he was completely startled. He said that he could not have imagined how anybody could come up with a solution like this, right? It's, so it's not incremental, it's actually discovering novelty uh, by these methods. And Hintzu Kont, as the Germans would say, that there is also uh, an ongoing movement, what is called the automation of science. Because, in fact, with such technologies, we have now evidence that at least certain um, procedures in science can be automated, including the design of the experiments to find out or to narrow down further, further uh, problems. Uh, um, again, Peter mentioned, for example, systems biology. Now, there is a group in the United States uh, who was given data from systems biology, uh, and the systems biologists thought that they have the simplest solution to the problem, huh? a neat equation, right? And then it was given to these AI people, and they came up with an equation which was half the size, right? Nobody understands at the moment how that is possible because uh, the, the, the equation that was favored by the scientists themselves came out of first principles, as we call it. It's very clear. And they, they thought, okay, that's the most condensed form. But actually, the form that these guys uh, discovered with the help of the computer, or the computer described it, uh, discovered it, you can convincingly say that, is actually smaller and even more accurate. So now they are analyzing the solution of the computer, what kind of hidden principle is behind it, that the experimental and theoretical people fail to see. So uh, there will be an automation of science as well. Uh, it's not going to be everywhere and it's not going to replace everything because you still need targeted questions. 
One of the, our creativity is about what we call peripheral vision, right? That I am reading something about population genetics. Next time I am reading, for example, something about quantum computers, right? And I say, oh, now I see a connection and I can develop a new theory. And now that it will be a very long time until computers get to that because you know they they will have to do targeted research for a long time. But in that case, they are going to be very successful, and they are going, as we see, I think they are going to supersede human intelligence. So that's an interesting development to watch. If you if you have a very complicated sequence of reactions to do in order to get a certain target compound. Uh, that has been given to computers already 30 years ago. Uh, uh, but recently, they could improve because of the uh, advancement of computers and so on and on. And the interesting thing is uh, that the computer finds thousands of possible uh, uh, reaction combinations going to the final product. Uh, some of them are completely ridiculous, every chemist can immediately rule it out because uh, the computer is not trained to look at this particular uh, difficult step. Uh, some work, and then there are some where uh, at least the experts claim we have, ne we have never thought about this possibility. So do you have the same thing? Uh, and what I believe is that the reason that that has to be analyzed and, and much more in detail is uh, the computer creates an enormous, much more than any human brain will create. And that what's important is to get rid of the, the useless of the false positives. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something which will help us a lot in the future. And this is the, 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 or the, the chess computer is similar or the Go computer. Uh, that's the way uh, they find this un, uh, unusual uh, working, <laughs> working results. Okay, now I would like to go to uh, maybe a more difficult question. It's a flip side of the same coin. So uh, um, where would you like to see society benefiting most from science? And conversely, where would you like to see science benefiting most from society? Okay, so you, uh, I don't want to cut this into two separate questions. Uh, this is an interesting question, a burning question. We are living in society, and I believe society needs us, but uh, how to do it slightly better? That's the question. Please. If I may start, uh, I would like to continue. Uh, and th this question... My answer to this question ties nicely into what we were talking about just before, like artificial intelligence. Because, for example, in astronomy, I think it's a very special uh, field of science because you don't need to be a professional to enjoy it. You can just, there are workshops and, and, and tutorials uh, teaching you how to build your own uh, telescope, or you can just buy a cheap telescope and bring it to your backyard and, and, and enjoy the night sky. And you can even make images, and, and there are repositories where you can upload your images, and, and everyone, including professional astronomers, can benefit from this. So it's, it's very nice in this way, this amateur astronomer community. And there's lots of in, very interesting citizen science projects. And, and this is because, I mean, we have astronomy used to be a, a data-starved science. So in, centuries ago, astronomers have to work their lifetime to obtain a few data points and to, to, to realize some, some law of nature. Now we are, we are drowning in data. And, and we need artificial intelligence to, to make sense of it, but it's not always the best solution. So for example, there are citizen science projects, like uh, you, you look at astronomical images from archives, you compare them, you look for objects that moved in time or changed their brightness in time, or, or you can look at images of galaxies and answer simple questions about them, and that would help astronomers classify galaxies, or, or you can even just when, uh, donate your like, uh, 
computer time to, to science projects, like when you download an app and then it recognizes when you don't use your computer and then it will run simulations, uh, astronomical simulations or data processing. So there are lots of uh, such projects. So, so in that sense, our, our field of science, astronomy, can benefit from, from citizens, from, from the society. It, it, also, uh, it is also true the other way around because uh, astronomy, it's what I like about astronomy is that it's very collaborative. I, I mentioned uh, concerning the first question that uh, we, we need to work with lots of uh, other fields of science to, to, to understand something like bisignatures or, or things like, other things like that. But we also need, yeah, we, 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 uh, so for, for that to be able to do astronomy, assuming that we will still have a, a technical society in, in, in some decades, it needs uh, lots of money and it needs global collaboration. And uh, this is really important and this is what I really enjoy in my, my field of science, that it fosters this kind of tolerance and collaboration. For example, in my uh, research group, there are people from India and Mexico and Colombia and Switzerland and <laughs> practically lots of, lots of places from the world. And, and I really enjoy this international aspect of it. Uh, it and we, for astronomy, we, because we, we build very, very special, very unique instruments that we use, we, we need to do technological innovation. And those are not uh, uh, isolated. They can sometimes be transferred to other applications, even to our uh, everyday life some, sometimes. And a very nice example, that I always uh, say, if I have the opportunity that when you switch on your uh, the, uh, Wi-Fi on your smartphone, uh, then you don't realize that uh, you have to uh, thank astronomers for it because it was radio astronomers who developed the method to sharpen images from radio telescopes. And that same method is used to strengthen the, the signal of, of the wireless network that you are using. So there are all kinds of disconnections between our everyday life and, and pure science through the technological innovations. That, that connects these things. I agree with you in many aspects, and there are many analogous also in, in biology and genetics, specifically in genetics. Uh, so the community of biohackers, for instance, is, is huge. And if you didn't know, you can actually buy stuff in the supermarket with which you can extract DNA from any tissue, plant or, or meat or your own, well, even your own blood, you could. You can do this with stuff that you buy in the supermarket, right? And biohackers know this and they use this. And you can grow bacteria with whatever stuff you can buy in any uh, do-it-yourself shop. So there has been a shift in, 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 the, in what is biology from being a, a full, uh, only a scientific activity to something that is like DIY community, like do-it-yourself <laughs> community. And this community actually plays a big role in innovation. Silicon Valley is full of startups, of people doing stuff in biotechnology that never finish a degree in biology, but they still do stuff that you wouldn't believe, right? Um, however, there's another level, oh, an, an, another aspect is that is also we, we've moved uh, from the no data to the big data. So uh, surprise, surprise, the, the most uh, fundamental or, or uh, foundational theories of evolutionary genetics were formulated even before the discovery of DNA, decades before. So these guys had the vision to understand how genetics works even without knowing what genes are. And these theories remained unchanged after the double helix and the whole genetic structure was discovered. Then came the era, or we are in the era, that Peter Schuster is commenting, where you know, sequencing genomes is, takes no time, takes no money. You double, you click twice in a web page, you get a kit next day, you speed on it, you close it, you send it, five days later you have your entire uh, genome. Huh? And they say you will die. <laughs> you, and say you, yeah, you may die of this or that or that, it gives you the risk of what you will die of, it gives you you are 50% uh, Hungarian, 30% idiot, uh, yeah. and also tells you how percentage you are ne Neanderthal. I don't know what is that useful for, but it tells you how Neanderthal you are, right? <laughs> And you do that for 100 euros. And it's 100 euros that you have to pay for this, right? And this is a company, so imagine what surprise they're actually uh, mm -hmm. processing your DNA. That's what you said, it's about $10 or 10 euros for processing your whole genome. 
Now, we have to move from the big data era to the good data era, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So, and, in, and here, I, ha I, have, uh, I have my own vision in my own, uh, of course, uh, interest, uh, where I would like to see society and, and, and uh, science benefiting from each other. And I think what comes here, and that's my main interest, is, uh, is synthetic biology, as I mentioned before. Like citing Feynman, what, you, what I cannot reconstruct, I cannot understand, we are going to that time now. The first synthetic organisms have already been achieved, and now we're in the era where we're starting to write DNA. Writing DNA means being able to re-engineer, rewire, redesign living beings. What for living beings? What for? Not only for fauna to see what happens, but for technological means. I was commenting to some of the fellows that today people are re-engineering yeast and instead of making beer out of that, you make milk. So you don't need to have cow, cows in a farm to, to actually make milk. You can, you can, uh, you can harvest from it uh, uh, spider silk, which is a thousand times more strong or a thousand times stronger than, than any, any uh, steel um, fiber of the same dimensions. And you cannot do that actually in, in real life, let's say, because spiders are scared of themselves. It's not only you scared of spiders, it's they are scared of themselves, they are territorial. So you cannot have a uh, you cannot have a, a spider farm, you cannot have it, right? So, but actually, you can put those genes, re-engineer the organism, and instead of brewing beer, you brew spider silk, and then you can make clothes out of spider silk. We will never break, etc. So, we are coming to a point that also will fulfill this kind of dreams of, uh, and that's actually how I started with this: how to re-engineer the the last universal common ancestor. How did it look like? Actually, we can rewire this thing. I mean, with certain knowledge, and we will be able to actually get a genome, a physical genome, which we could actually replace on some uh, surrogate cell and, you know, get the thing going. And this was the original ancestor of life, and so on. You can dream further on this. But this is the part I would love uh, to see uh, science uh, developing because the implications beyond all this fun and, and interesting stuff is that actually uh, it's, gonna, it's already having uh, important applications in superfoods, which is uh, relevant, of course, for a growing population, for personalized medicine, because you can build uh, uh, tailored tests or, or, or solutions, for instance, for cancer, or, or there's going to be a huge impact in green energy, because we are re-engineering algae in order to make uh, more efficient yields of, of ethanol or, or biofuels. In conservation, we, we can, to some extent, revert um, revert uh, species that we ourselves have, have killed or that are endangered. Uh, climate change, okay, this is not also obvious how it relates to synthetic biology, but through biofuels and through all many other processes that we can, that we can um, uh, redesign, we can uh, ease the impact that we have on climate. And of course, last but not least, in neglected diseases. This is something that today we we are forgetting because it's not important for us, because we are not at risk of getting some strange disease that happens only in Malaysia, but with the change of global, of, 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 of climate, and I would leave this to Dan, I don't want to step into his shoes, this is gonna be something that affects us. And the, the solutions we will find to this is actually largely, not only, but largely in synthetic biology. Uh, one last thing to put the other side of the coin, and then I pass it because I'm talking too long, uh, how science should benefit from society is mostly not in this sense, although I agree also at these levels, but also we need urgently a restructuring of the academic system. That is a big issue that we're facing now that is making science swamp in its goals and in, way, in the way it is working. And finally, most importantly, we need a better system for technology transfer. Technology and academia remain too separate and this cannot be I mean, it can be, but it's not at all useful. And the only way for science to survive in the next years is actually to bridge this gap between what is basic science and what, and what is uh, technology, right? We need to have a continuum there. Okay, that's enough for me. There's, there's no question that, that, um, that science is going to need complete buy-in from society um, if we're going to be able to ensure that this all continues to exist. Um, and that, that goes the, the, the whole range from citizen scientists, uh, and there, there are lots of you know, individual initiatives and things like that, 
that have already been implemented in the biodiversity realm and things like that, sustainable development issues. Largely, we know what to do. This is, this is one of the great tragedies of the fact that humanity seems to want to kill itself, or at least it wants to destroy its, its technological, itself in its technological mode, is that there are a lot of really good scientists that know what to do. We know how, even though the danger is great and the time is short, and we're largely unprepared, we're not dead yet, and we know what to do. You sure? But, well, you may be dead, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, th that's the reason it is, it is the flip side of, of the same coin. You know, this is, science and society can no longer be two different things. And until both the scientific community and the non-scientific community in its professional to its lay mode actually internalize the fact that this is not a joke. That for you students in the audience, your children or, or your grandchildren may ask you what kind of fish you catch with an internet. And they may ask you to tell that funny story again about how you used to have a little box like this and you could talk to somebody you couldn't even see. That's what's at stake. So we're at this really interesting point where we've never been better. We've never been more powerful. We've never had more amazing possibilities right on the horizon. And we've never been closer to losing all of it. Not as a species. And Homo sapiens is going to do fine. But this is, this is at risk. And if science and society don't decide that they're going to work together, if we don't cooperate, then you know, we'll, we can easily go back to the sixth century. Do you have any suggestions how to start? Well, you have some of them that I, I gave well, you last year, and yeah. we've written a whole book on it, and there's an enormous literature out there. And that's not the function of, you know, me to talk about my particular proposal is not the function of this but I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. And you know what? I'm on Google. <laughs> I'm on ResearchGate. Uh, you can find all that stuff. And that's part of the tragedy. There's, there is an enormous literature out there. There are actually a number of things that have been tried that haven't worked, so we also know it doesn't work. And so again, that's, what, you know, that's largely what the next 30 years is going to determine for us. Can we cooperate? To save ourselves? Do we actually give a shit about our children? Stuff like that. And that's got to be a science and society together operation. We can't afford Breitbart news. We can't afford postmodernist claptrap. We have to save ourselves. Uh, I, I have a brief very brief comment on synthetic biology. Uh, I admire synthetic biology, and it's marvelous what the people achieve, but it's also worth thinking uh, what they are really doing, because a cell is a cell, and nobody has uh, uh, assembled a cell from scratch so far, Also, many people are trying. For me, synthetic biology is like, for instance, you have a car, and what you know to do is how to take out uh, a, light bulb. a bench, a light bulb, or you replace a, a black steering wheel by a red one or by a bar, <laughs> or, or for instance, at the maximum, you put in a diesel engine where you had previously a, a gasoline engine. Mm -hmm. So, so this is just, just a comment. It's, it's marvelous what they can do, but it's still a long, long way yeah. to go uh, before one can resemble a cell. And for the oh, yeah. two questions that you were putting up, Irish, uh, I have one answer what would be most beneficial. Learning how to ask the right questions. For science, when they look on society, what are the problems in society? And for society, to look at science, how, how do they address questions? For scientists, or for me when I work, uh, using intuition and uh, dreams and making big leaps is uh, how I move forward. But when I have to explain uh, stuff to my colleagues, I have to convince them, I have to rely 
on uh, rational arguments. And this is something which um, I find uh, slightly scary about the, the politics of today, that quite often I, I see that the, the value of rational arguments is, is going down, and the, the space which is given to rational arguments between people who try to move our society forward is, uh, sh is shrinking. And I think this is something which would, would be very good if, if, if society could um, take on from, from scientists this um, method of communication to use uh, critical thinking and uh, rational arguments. I mean, just mention one little example is that uh, I'm interested also in uh, secondary school education, as uh, some of our fellows know. And uh, uh, whenever I look at biology textbooks, uh, invariably is the evolutionary part that is the worst, which is a tragedy because that's really the uh, major underlying explanatory theory of the whole thing. Now, if you don't get that right, then there is a problem. Then you are building on sand. So there is, in fact, a lot of room for improvement in education. Uh, since I would like to give the floor also to the audience and, uh, you know, possibly to ask questions, uh, I am going to ask uh, 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 basically one more question, one which is a little bit longer to uh, answer, and one very short question. Okay, so there will be two more questions, and then I will hand uh, the floor to the audience to... Uh, to, to make comments and ask questions. So the, the first question, uh, the longer question I would like to uh, ask is the following. Uh, what do you think about the future of the relationship of science and the social sciences and the humanities? Essentially, it's all about collaboration. It needs, it needs to have a suitable collaborative system. And this is very hard to achieve uh, between disciplines that are very different. Okay, so... Uh, when we see in science today how difficult it is to collaborate between a neuroscientist and an evolutionary biologist to mention some that we know, right? That's, it's almost impossible. Collaboration between physicists and biologists, well, they happen, but it's pretty tough. So we're facing actually a very dissimilar uh, subject that is not unsur unsurmountable, but actually uh, require a very active effort from both sides. Usually the attitude is like, I'm a biologist, or like, well, I'm an um, anthropologist, so well, you know, this is what I know, and that's what you know, and there's uh, very hard communication, actually. Uh, but there are good examples in science where there has been a consensus and, when, and that is when there is a very important common interest. One, one example which is my favorite, one of my favorites, is a collaboration between geneticists and anthropologists, okay, when there was all this uh, new uh, uh, um, uh, rush about uh, Neanderthals and Denisovians and ta -ta -ta -ta, all this, uh, well, then finally the, these two communities got hand in hand because they really needed each other, right? I mean, uh, a biologist could not do, uh, you know, going to the field themselves without messing the whole stuff because they needed this to be just like perfect because the risk of contamination with your own, own DNA is big. There are a thousand reasons. The second one is linguistics, which is yet to be consolidated, right? But it's a field where there's a very strong collaboration between biologists, between um, computer science and, um, and linguistics, okay? This still needs a lot of work. But to get, uh, uh, and the third one, which is even less uh, exploited or less developed, is that one of my favorites too, which is cultural change and evolution. This is a tough one because we, it, communication between biologists or biology-like scientists and, and cultural anthropologists or sociologists is very hard. There are many prejudices from side and side and many... Um, defensive positions, and, and this is really tough. So it comes down to a question of how to uh, develop and construct a platform where actually both parties can learn about the other side in, you know, easy, right, in a, in a straightforward way, and actually collaborate and communicate. I just spent six months at, at um, what's called the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study in South Africa, and there was a fairly large group of public policy people there. Um, who I, I learned from a lot. 
And one of the things that they, they made very, very strong uh, statements to me about was that they really <coughs> need more scientifically literate and scientifically educated people in public policy. And what they really would like to see is people with biology and, and physics and chemistry undergraduate degrees, maybe even master's degrees, going into public policy, doing their PhDs in public policy, and then going into um, you know, NGO, United Nations, individual governmental, their own governmental organizations. In other words, really intercalating themselves into the business because at the moment, there are a lot of public policy people who know how to talk to the, the people who can say yes. But they don't know the science very well. So if the scientist can't explain something very complicated to someone who's, who's motivated, but not scientifically literate, they can't explain it to the people who can actually say yes. And, and that's, that's, that's what I think would be a really, really helpful thing on, on all of the fronts that we've been talking about. Okay, so my comment would be that uh, that, that ties in what Harold said about communication between natural scientists and social scientists and, and the, the need to be aware of what the other group is doing. And I, I just recently realized that because I, I won a prize that is uh, given each year to uh, women in science. And so there was this award ceremony in Paris, and afterwards, lots of journalists came to interview me. And they were asking questions like, what do you think about women in science? How, how can we increase their participation? How can we uh, increase their visibility or their, their, how, to, to raise more awareness to, to their work? Or how can we spark the interest of more young girls in sciences? And I was like, I don't know. I was completely unprepared for this question. Because I'm, it's, it's not my field of science. I'm, I'm an astronomer. I'm, I'm living this situation. Of, I'm not studying this situation. And that made me realize that I need to be aware what is being done in this field. What, what, what are the, the research directions and what, what, what needs to be done in this field? Because, I mean, we are people. We are, effect, we, we are part of the society. We, we work in the society. So we need to understand what's going on in social sciences. One possible relationship between social human sciences and natural sciences is that basically training in natural science these days do not or very often don't involve much so, sort of soft skills, which are already available. There are departments in many universities in the social science uh, faculties and so on. What sort of soft skills? Uh, uh, am I referring to very simple things like communicating with people, with you know, with broader audiences or uh, specialists in the field, managing a research group? Like uh, many scientists get maybe get a million euro grant without having any formal training on on how to manage uh, people or projects. Of course, these are smart guys, so they will just figure out by doing. But uh, what if? Uh, some some of these skills could be, you know, taught to them beforehand, or how to collaborate, just as you, as you mentioned, how to motivate people, which is really about psychology, or how to ne negotiate with your dean or uh, with uh, with your colleague in the faculty. So these are all skills that there are trainings out there. You don't have to discover any of these. You just have to link with formal training, maybe after the PhD or before someone becomes a principal investigator. What I find is uh, uh, the, science, the science can help the social sciences uh, to formulate uh, uh, quanti uh, features that can be quantified. Uh, in most of, most of the humanities and in social sciences, one really hates any kind of quantitative measures. And well, I, I fully agree that you cannot cast everything into numbers. This is completely right. But you can cast a number of things in numbers, and that's very helpful. And this, uh, this is what uh, social sciences uh, uh, can, in a way, uh, uh, learn from science how to do this. 
On the other hand, uh, uh, the social sciences and the humanities uh, provide a, a, a rich collection of problems uh, for complexity research where you may take the experience uh, uh, from science. 20 years ago, people thought when they know how to solve complex problems in physics, they know how to solve complex problems in social sciences as well. Now this time is, uh, is over. Uh, one knows that uh, things are very different. However, risk uh, conflict prevention, risk management, are subjects which are treated in different contexts in complexity research, and this can be really useful for the social sciences to see how one can, for instance, uh, there is a there is a there is a lot of uh, risk management nece uh, necessary uh, uh, when you want to avoid technical problems like. Uh, collapsing houses, collapsing tunnels, and so on. And there are, there are some, I, I guess, there are something that can be learned also from the, for the more complex situations. Let me mention something which I find fascinating and very important, and a potential role model. So in 2014, they have created a new Max Planck Institute in Jena, and the name of the institute is Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. And that uh, institute has three departments, archaeogenetics, archaeology, linguistic and cultural evolution. They are treating the following questions. The settlement history of the world through past human migrations and genetic admixture events. The spread and diversification of human associated microbes and infectious diseases. The impact of climatic and environmental change on human subsistence in different world regions. Human modification of ecosystems. The rise of early forms of global trade systems. The spread and diversification of languages, cultures, and social practices. And finally, the coevolution of genes and culture. And the people come from the following fields paleogenetics, proteomics, bioinformatics, anthropology, archaeology, history, and quantitative linguistics. All right? So I think that that is really a rose model. And this is also something that I ask can also. Uh, keep a very close eye on. Uh, so with this, I would like to get to the f uh, final question and then, then give the floor to the audience. And I would like to ask you to give an answer in one word. And uh, the question is the following. Which single adjective would you describe the science of the coming decades? And I, I start with Peter because I know he... Integrated. He, Big data. That's two words. <laughs> two words. <laughs> <laughs> data. Ah, I struggle with this one. I say I think it's challenged. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would vote for the integrated. So I fully agree with Peter. Cool. <laughs> Exciting. Panic stricken. <laughs> that has a hyphen. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, dear, pan dear, dear panelists, I would like to thank uh, really for your efforts, for your wisdom that you have uh, laid on the table. And now I would like to hand over the possibility to the audience to make comments and ask questions. Please go ahead. I learned a lot about uh, cutting edge research on many fields, but I think that uh, in recent uh, years, uh, science is, is partly uh, motivated by by real life events. For example, uh, environmental uh, science is, is mostly a follow up science, which follows some sort of catastrophic <coughs> event that needs a scientific answer. Just uh, think of the ozone hole, which was first occurred, then researched, and then solved, and Nobel, even Nobel Prize was, uh, 
awarded to, to the solution. But it was not uh, a planned uh, research, it was initiated by the event itself. And I anticipate that in the, in the future, in the coming decades, there will be more of that follow-up research, which, uh, were, which will be initiated by, by actual uh, happenings, by actual catastrophic events occurring all around the world. And that would need really an integrated approach or uh, <coughs> arching over disciplines because these, were, these will be <coughs> complex problems to be solved. For example, if B communities uh, will rapidly collapse, then from one year to another, then need some scientific uh, research to, to prevent it or to restore B communities, which is uh, very important for human life. And, and I would say any other examples that may occur in the future which need uh, integrated scientific approach. And this is something which is not planned, it cannot be planned in advance, but, but uh, science has to be able to respond very quickly to, to such uh, catastrophic events in order to, to save uh, humanity. Good point, and it points up a, a, a really common misconception that none of the things that are happening with respect to climate change uh, or emerging diseases can be predicted or anticipated, and therefore we can only respond, we can only react after the fact, and therefore the only economy of scale we have is how rapidly we respond to a crisis after it's already happened. That's the reason we're losing the battle so badly. That's why it's unsustainable financially. And the reality is, it's not true. It makes, it defeats the public. It makes the public feel like they, there's no hope. And it's not true. Now, we cannot stop climate change, but we can anticipate what's coming at us. And if we know what's coming at us, we can mitigate the impact. Okay, that, 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 was, that was basically the, that was the theme of, of the conference in Singapore that I, that I spoke in. And if you think I'm bad, I was the most optimistic person in the room. Okay. And, and one of the guys who, who is a, a tsunami and and, and uh, sea level rise specialist. He said, here's the problem we have. It's what they call black elephants. You know, so the, the elephant in the room and the, in the black swan. So the black swan is something that's so, you couldn't even imagine it happens until it suddenly happened. So we didn't, until we went, you know, Europeans went to Australia, all the philosophers had these syllogisms about, you know, all swans are white, and then they went to Australia and found a black swan, and that threw it into a mess. The elephant in the room is the thing that we know is a problem, but we ignore it. We sort of hope it goes away. So the black, black elephants are rare events that are catastrophic that we know are going to happen, but we don't know that they're going to happen tomorrow. So when you go to a politician, and, and this is what Chris said, he said, you go to a politician in Singapore, for example, and the politician says, what are the odds that Singapore is going to experience a catastrophic tsunami this year? I said, well, infinitesimal, very low. Okay, then I don't want to, I, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> okay? What are the odds that this is going to hit during my term in office? Very, very low. Then I don't want to hear about it. And he said, the problem is they don't know to ask the right question. And the right question is, what are the chances that in the next 30 years, Singapore is going to experience a catastrophic tsunami or, or sea level event? And the answer is 100%. And we know that. And it could be tomorrow. It might not be until 99 years and 364 days from now. But that doesn't mean we cannot anticipate it. It means we don't care enough to spend the money to anticipate rare events. Okay, for example, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States of America, its plan for emerging diseases in the United States is this. It will never happen here. <laughs> that is their plan. That's the reason they're in Africa doing all kinds of unethical human experiments on Africans because they don't care about Africans who are sick. 
They just want to know about diseases in Africa that might possibly get to the United States and how do they keep that out. And you know what? You cannot build a big enough wall to keep diseases out and still have things like international travel and tourism and blueberries from Chile in the middle of the year and all these things. And the reality is that they're already wrong. Until last April, the Centers for Disease Control's official policy was there is no Zika virus in the United States. Last April, they called a special press conference to announce that there were defective Zika babies in 44 out of 50 states. That means that they lied to the public, they lied to every married couple in America who was thinking about having a child for one reproductive cycle. And we know from the experience in Brazil that even though only a tiny fraction of Zika babies are microcephalic, all of them have some neurological deficit. It's mostly vision problems and hearing problems. But they're all, they all have deficits. And the reality is that was a known issue. That was something we could have anticipated, something we should have anticipated. You can't stop it. Okay, and you're right in that sense. We can never make plans, and we should never make plans that say, this will never happen, because that's the way to have catastrophes. But we can say, this is coming at us. But that means we're going to have to cooperate. The best way to mitigate emerging diseases coming into Hungary is to actually help people in Northern Africa, mm -hmm and in Italy, and in Serbia, and Croatia, know what's going on there, because that's coming at us. If you wait until it's here, it's too late. Now, how many of you know, for example, that, okay, 65% of the calories that human beings eat every day on this planet, corn, wheat, and rice. Okay, how many of you eat something made out of wheat? here every day, no, all of you. How many of you know that there is a rust fungus infecting wheat in the Middle East that does not respond to any known fungicide? That we are facing the loss of wheat as a food crop within a decade. Nobody knows about that. Ah, 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 ah. What are the odds that it's going to come from 2,000 kilometers away to the wheat fields here? Oh, 100%. What are the odds that it will happen before the next election? Zero. So will it be a campaign issue here? No, of course not. And then when it doesn't happen the year after that, it, it, nobody will think about it. Okay, Sao Paulo, Brazil. We have a big, huge city. We want to have green power for this city. OK, we'll build a lot of hydroelectric dams. We'll even build biology stations along the rivers to make sure that those dams are not screwing up the biodiversity. It's wonderful. All of a sudden now, we have predictable water supply, enormous amounts of hydroelectricity. It's all green. Then it stopped raining. <laughs> you know, climate change. That's the reason Cape Town, South Africa now is operating at less than 10% capacity in its reservoirs. If you don't cooperate, you know, you can't anticipate. If you don't anticipate, you can't lower the costs enough to be able to buy enough time to find real solutions. Okay, so I don't mean to single you out, but this is a, it, there is a common misperception that, that we can't anticipate this stuff. We can only wait and respond. But that's what's killing us right now. We actually, we actually do have some really good ideas about what's coming at us. But because we're dealing with complex systems and, and nonlinear dynamics, we don't know it could be tomorrow, it could be... 30 years from now. We don't know. We know that sometime in that time frame, you know, NASA anticipates that the United States is going to begin a drought cycle in 2020, which will last until 2050. 
And during that period of time, the most optimistic projections they have is that the United States will lose 35% of its food production, which will destroy its international trade and also cause an enormous number of people who rely on American food aid to starve to death. By the time that drought is over, the first major sea level increase is supposed to be hitting, which will drive that 50% of America that lives within 100 kilometers of the coastline inland where all the agricultural lands are. And if you think the United States is an anti-immigrant country right now, wait until that happens. And when the sea level rises, it's like science. If it's, if it's right in New Zealand, it's right here. If there's a sea level rise along the coast of North Carolina, you know, Hungary's going to be okay. You're up high, you're in the Carpathian Plain. But more than 50% of humans now live within 100 kilometers of the ocean. I'm definitely the last person to defend politicians who don't care. <laughs> but uh, I think there is one thing we often forget when uh, discussing various catastrophic events, and this is finite budgets. If you, if you for instance, spend a lot of money uh, for uh, protection against avalanches in our country, uh, this, uh, this money will not be there uh, uh, to make riverbeds. And, and so you have a finite budget, and what science actually could provide, and I think that can be improved, is decent probabilities what's going to happen. A major earthquake or a tsunami is a low probability event, at least in, 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 in my view. However, wood fires are not low probability events. They occur every year in California and now also in, in Polish, Southern yeah. Europe. And, and there you can do a lot uh, to be prepared uh, that you can fight uh, uh, such uh, wood fires and nothing happens. <laughs> so I, 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 I followed what was happening in Portugal where people were killed, quite a number of people were killed. Just the fire brigade was not prepared to handle a wood fire, <laughs> and, and, and they happened there all the time. So I think they, they, with probabilities, uh, politicians should be responsible to care for the uh, medium-sized probability events. You cannot ask them to care for every low probability event. This is a, what, something that I understand. But in, in the least, in, in the, the small probability events, or for instance, uh, when, when you have floods every year, you can do something against it. At least in the Alps, you can do. I'm uh, somewhere probably um, even more pessimistic than Dan. You know, the United States, why? I have all sorts of questions for you. Is the issue in terms of science not gender bias? I mean, I've looked at all the photos of the great scientific discoveries like, um, for example, um, the work on the first atomic bomb. The photographs show all the wonderful scientists who were working with Enrico Fermi, one woman out of 16 or 17. Google's brain, right, the artificial intelligence team, Picture in the New York Times, 17 people, one woman wearing a baseball cap in the last row, trying, trying to pretend she was one of the boys, I'm sure. I think the kind of reasoning that scientists have engaged in is gendered and deeply problematic. I try to imagine if there was a woman at Los Alamos who would have said what Oppenheimer said when they set off the bomb. I have become death, destroyer of worlds. That's what the science, the gendered science, of the last couple of hundred years has led to. So what to do? What about scientists becoming political? Instead of just being critical of political people, why not scientists become critical? Have you ever struck? Have you ever gone on strike? Have you ever said no to the whole system? Organized it? I don't think so. I think scientists have generally a feeling of being fairly comfortable with their knowledge world. But I don't think they seem to really take it 
the way they should. I hear it somewhat with Dan, and I would like to see a hell of a lot more of it, but I don't think it's going to come because of the comfort that I see amongst so many scientists, and I've worked closely with some. You touched several important issues there. I will comment only on the last one. Uh, it is a big issue, but uh, it's not true that people remain comfortable in their knowledge world. Uh, especially people at my career stage in this uh, time of, of history, right? Like we are producing too many PhDs, um, there are no enough postdoc positions and even less uh, assistant professorships and not enough grants. So it is true that there is no, no um, revolution in the sense we expected, like people organizing and, and going to burn down the Academy of Sciences or something like that. But there are indeed alternative uh, ways in, in which uh, this society is reacting. Okay? Um, there are huge power structures in science that's true on the biopolitics of science. It's a very hard subject to address because uh, you cannot criticize it from within because then you're you're done, and if you criticize it from outside, it's, well, you're outside anyway, right? So, Have I... Have tried it from within? Uh, in, in some ways, I've tried it, yes. Um, I've tried it. I've tried to create a, um, a society for, for how I was calling it. Um, I, I can't recall now, but it failed because I didn't find enough people willing to join it. Uh, my first name was a Society for Frustrated Intellectuals, but uh, everyone was uh, against that, so we came with a more politically correct one. But ultimately, people didn't join about it. Uh, when I wrote my, my, my master's thesis in art, it's, uh, it's entitled Ariadne's Threat for a Scientific Labyrinth. I published it with an alter ego name, which I will not mention. Uh, and was a strong critique to it, right? And I even used some material which would be very sensitive, which would that devastate my career in five minutes if people would know I published this, even when it was anonymous at every possible level. Um, so you confront a structure that is very, very um, strong in terms of uh, hierarchies and powers. So as uh, Giorgio Agamben would say, you know, um, um, an apparatus cannot be modified except from within, right? You cannot, you cannot defeat an apparatus once its uh, whole power structure is, 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 is built. Uh, unless you're from within. But once you're in within, uh, you have the total risk of, of being corrupted by it because, well, then you are in your stable, safe position. Okay, I think I would like to also reflect on this because partly I, uh, I agree with you in the sense that gender bias is really devastating. It, it, it practically means that we are not using the intellectual uh, power of, of half of the population. So it's, it's really a big problem. But when you ask us what we did against it, I feel a bit, unf that question is a bit unfair because from, from my perspective, I mean, I, I'm a researcher, so I'm content when I can do research. But we, I, I also have to do a lot of other things. I, I need to teach, I need to be a mentor, I, I need to give interviews, I need to participate in panel discussions. <laughs> and I mean, I can have 20 hour work days for a couple of weeks, but then I crash and then I won't be able to work. So <laughs> it's difficult and it, it, it will not change from one day to, an to another, even if, if, if all the scientists will, will work towards gender equality. We need to work towards it, it but sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm not enough for this. I would also like to comment. So you, you expect a revolution from scientists, but I think most scientists are not very revolutionary in the political sense, at least in my institute or in my university, if I look around, I see pretty much the same percentage of people uh, rooting for whichever political side. I, I think there are some things at, at which people are very good at, people who are in science, but not necessarily finding the right path forward society is not necessarily one of these things. 
I agree with this, and I, this comes to, to this division of, of labor, basically, that, that it would be best if everyone does what they do the best. So if I'm doing good science, then I should do science. If I'm not good at communicating it, that should be the responsibility of someone else who, who does it well. And one single person cannot do all of this. It would be nice, but it just doesn't work like that. If I may, uh, uh, if I allow me, I would like to make two comments. One is that uh, I think, Jim, your example about the Manhattan Project is a bit unfair in the following sense. Uh, uh, of course, you are right that if more women had been there, it could have taken a different path. But first and foremost, that was an applied technological project, right? It was not, uh, you know, uh, something that was deliberately set up to uh, get at new scientific truth or whatever. There were byproducts, but that was not uh, the main issue. And uh, uh, in that sense, I have to say that one has to be very careful. I think you were not here at the beginning of the discussion. I said very clearly that, you know, you don't have uh, conservative scientific truth, Muslim scientific truth, you just have scientific truth. And if you want to achieve a scientific result, ultimately, ultimately, not necessarily in the social setting, ultimately it will be subjected to the same test by the community in the long run. So that, that I, I want to say uh, very firmly. The second thing I want to say is, uh, it, that's a pessimistic remark, um, and it uh, <laughs> ties into what uh, uh, my colleagues have said. You see, um, now, that's not very, uh, very happy to say, but um, um, let's face it, a, a sizable group, and I deliberately don't want to give you a fraction, but a sizable group of academics are, how should I say, not very brave, to put it mildly, right? And that has got several reasons. One of them is that many of them would be incapable to survive in any other area of society. Now that, of course, gives you a, a, a dependence you know, on your masters who feed you in a general sense. But that doesn't apply to everybody, right? So uh, what, what, what those academics that are not cowards can do are, for example, the following. You know, the, there is the dull academic system, and we said that it has to be there from this one. But one of the things that you can do, and I'm speaking from experience, is to establish a local environment where these usual donkey ladders and these kinds of things don't count. Right? This is what I wanted to do all my life after I got some success, and I, I hope, you know, well, there are a few people who can testify, that has had a tremendous impact on the development of those people. So you basically, you give a shield, right? And you fend off a lot of shit that you, is raining from above, and then these people can develop in non-standard ways, right? I, I think that's a very important activity, but you need to be, you, you cannot be a coward for that. Who funds these programs? DARPA, Defense Senate, Advanced Research Projects Administration? What do they fund? Would you have worked on the bomb project? Probably not. You, I would hope not. Probably, well, probably, I don't know. You, 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 we have to be careful, we are not on the same situation, and, but probably not. No, but I, you know, this is the issue. There doesn't seem to be a moral stroke political understanding amongst scientists of the kinds of things that they work on and their consequences for society. And unless one stops and says, wait a second, this is why we're in part of the reason, a fundamental reason, why we're in the dilemma we are today that Dan so eloquently described. Well, I don't, uh, I don't want to make this argument very long, but be careful again because uh, you know the famous Einstein letter to the president, right? Mm -hmm. And that that was born because uh, uh, several people were deeply afraid that Nazi Germany could have the atomic bomb. And now we know from the files that they were actually right; they were working on the problem. So uh, that's why they didn't discontinue the project when Nazi Germany was defeated. Yeah, that's another issue. I agree well, with you. Five. 
You know, that's, that's another issue. I agree with you. But the beginning was a different one. Everybody knows I'm an American citizen. Everybody knows that the current administration of the United States of America has an official position that there is no climate change and a subsidiary uh, position that it's actually a hoax perpetrated by China. What most people don't know is that there is one organization in the United States of America that has fully prepared contingency plans for how to cope with all of the threat multipliers for climate change, including the things that won't ever happen but will happen inevitably, for mass pandemics, for drought, for flood, for starvation, and that is the Department of Defense. The United States military spends more money on factual evidence about climate change than any other branch of the American government. And so that's why it's, you know, it's not so goddamn simple. The world's very complicated. Okay? Now, here's the point. If the American government is, if the American military is doing this, every military in the world is doing it. I guarantee you that the Hungarian military has contingency plans for what to do about pandemics, part of which they have already implemented in trying to slow down the influx of people who may be carrying pathogens to which they are resistant, but Europeans are not. And you may have objections with some of the philosophy or what you think is some of the philosophy behind it, but I guarantee you that the military thinking is completely pragmatic. And if climate change is literally beyond belief, if there are no favored countries or religions or economic systems on this planet, and if climate change is a national security issue for every country, it is a global national security issue. And the question then is not whether or not individual scientists have any guts. It's a question of whether or not society is going to decide to save itself by cooperating on a scale that we've never done before. And to do that, we have to get beyond the ad hominem attacks. I'm, I'm sorry, Jim, but that was not a helpful comment. Especially since you accused me of some things that you actually don't have any evidence about. Okay, you, for example, do not know that I spent about $8,000 of my own money to fly from Cape Town to Washington, D.C., to march in the goddamn streets for the first time since, uh, since Vietnam. But you know what? The fact that there were only 100,000 people there and there are millions of scientists, I don't care. That doesn't make me think less of the scientists who said, I can't do that. The basic questions of science. Uh, I mean, the role of science is to answer basic questions such as, what is our world like, including ourselves? Uh, another might be, how can our world be improved, be made that better place? Um, further, it seems to me that uh, people in the forefront of uh, the social and uh, uh, natural sciences are on the brink of being able to put together a short list of the most severe problems plaguing humanity, uh, environmental hazard, overpopulation, selfishness, exploitation, being at variance with the Ten Commandments, <laughs> Christianity, and so on. Uh, and it also seems to me that the world is becoming increasingly complex and increasingly tremendous to influence, to make any profound changes. Uh, lots of your own remarks mm. that have referred to specifically this difficulty. Now, might it be possible that instead of changing the world, we <coughs> might change ourselves? Uh, by this I mean that uh, I should think that the answer to the uh, feasibility of this problem very soon will be yes. 
The question is, will have science the moral right to change humanity, to nudge humanity ever so gently into a direction where uh, humanity will not endanger themselves in this fashion that they are doing it now. For as it seems at the moment, in a hundred years, uh, society might be, as we know it today, be a thing of the past. And before, to drag me to the quality of the heavy burden. No, 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 no. Uh, no this is, that's, that's I would like to remind one. you that one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, uh, Stanislav Lem, has asked the same question in his novel, The Returning. I, I have a, a very good friend who's a science fiction writer named Peter Watts, who's also very popular in Poland, by the way, for that reason. And Peter has a, a PhD in evolutionary ecology in his background, as well as being a writer. He's also on the selection committee for the X Prizes, but possibly not for very much longer, because all the selection committee members for the X Prize were just asked to write essays this is very Trump-like exercise. They were asked to write essays that basically were talking about what a wonderful thing the whole X Prize concept is, and by extension, you know, the person who started the whole thing up. So Peter wrote an essay about neurological manipulation, neurological engineering. He said, "What if we are able? The person gets the neurobiologist gets the X Prize for being able to rewire human beings." so that they will get a positive dopamine response out of making a tough decision. So they will actually love to be faced with difficult decisions, and they will love to do something about it. And then the essay, of course, goes on, and, and of course you can imagine then when all the tough things are solved, then people are going to want to create artificial difficult decisions just to get a buzz. And, and the whole thing falls apart, and it's an apocryphal story about you know, the, 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 uh, the potential problems of, of you know, beware of what you ask for, right? And, and apparently, he's, he's pretty well convinced that he will not, no longer be on the selection committee after, after submitting that essay. But you're right in that sense that, that the question of, of we can do this has to be linked with, but should we? And depending on whether, de as far as I'm concerned, depending on how humanity responds in the next 30 years, the question of whether should we do this or not may be swept aside in a panic. And so that's why I always talk, I don't talk about, you know, doing away with any of this stuff. I talk about buying time to find solutions. And something like that, that, that requires a lot of thought and a lot of, a lot of discussion. And it's not something that we should make in a panel. So the only thing I would say is that what I, what I want for, for science policy for the next 30 years is, is activities that buy us time to think. And, and for people like me, buy us time to maintain this for our children and our grandchildren so that they have time to figure it out. And uh, because I'm a social psychologist, uh, I'm especially interested that how do you see the role of the individual in the uh, social metrics of the science? So, uh, the romantic uh, imagination that the individual has the insight and the, the discovery and the courage to. Uh, fight for the uh, truth, or is it increasingly a collective teamwork? Well, I think the day of the great man of science is long gone. Yeah, <laughs> it's all a group effort now. I think both Me are, neither. I think both are very important, and and both have a place in science. It should it should it should be like that? I agree, but I think it's mostly um, career success driven. So that takes away a lot of this romantic uh, motivation. Well, my take on it is that you actually have a distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> depending on 
uh, where to ask, what to ask, whatever, right? Then in certain cases, it will, the idea will still be coming from a single individual who has a penetrating insight, right? No question about it, even from the recent literature, I can give you examples that that, that happens, right? Uh, so it, that's never going to disappear. However, if we believe in what Peter said, that the uh, next uh, 30 years of science can be characterized by one word called integrated, that necessarily means also that a lot of it will be cooperative, uh, and the two are not mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a distribution of these effects, individual and cooperative things. I promise to be uh, the last question, we have to be on schedule, but, you know, practic except for Peter, all the speakers are here all day, uh, including the late afternoon and the evening, so you can uh, ask any further question, but with apologies, I have, to, I have to close now the session with many thanks to the panelists. I think you have done a great job, and to the audience as well. Thank you very much.